the forest, he loves us, and he sent his son to die for us. Love and loyalty, blessing and grace for us. And it definitely don't deserve it. But in those times, to remember that. Those hard times, to remember that. And to praise him for it. And to thank him in it. The coming of the Lord. The sins I've ever sinned. You're not through Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, praise team. What a great way to start our time of worship here at Provision Church this morning, just praising the King of Kings. My name is Brian Stevenson. I'm one of the congregational elders here, and I'd just like to welcome you in person here today on campus as our social distancing continues and online. If you're watching with us, I've already seen a, a bunch of you are watching online. So we just want to welcome you to worship with us wherever you are right now. We are just excited. And, and just remember that we are a Christ-centered community driven by the joy of the gospel to make disciples who make disciples. That's what we're all about here at Provision Church. And if you don't have a church home, we invite you to come alongside us and, and continue to experience that joy of Jesus Christ as we praise him and work to grow closer to him each and every day. Um, just a couple things, if, if you're uh, first timer here or even your second or third time if you've never filled out a connect card or even online you have the ability to do that uh, you see the number up there 704 
704-703-9025. I'll say that one more time for those watching at home. 704-703-9025. If you will text connect to that, we'll simply give you a little bit of information and uh, just tell you how you can uh, learn more about Provision Church. We also have uh, cards out front and just in uh, safety, you even get to keep the pen if you fill that out for us so we can just be as uh, safe and health conscious as we can. So we hope you'll do that so we can get to know you. And another thing, talking about health and safety as we continue to navigate all these uh, different things uh, with, with COVID over the, over the course of time. I know things se sometimes seem like they, they change minute by minute, but uh, I know some of you uh, were hoping that we would be going back to kids very soon. And while we do still have a kids area that we kind of moved over here under the shade, um, we're putting that on hold for right now. So I know some of you, that's news to some of you that we're going to be putting that on hold for a little while. We've, we've constantly, as this has uh, uh, been going on, uh, evaluated from the health perspective and working with our, our host, uh, Church here at Hopewell. And, and we've just been in constant, constant communication with them on this and constant communication with, with the health experts. And right now, just talking with Hopewell, the best thing to do uh, for both our campuses is to just put that on hold for right now. And, and we hope sooner than later, we'll be able to uh, get you back to your kids' ministry area. I know the volunteers that help with that on the serve teams love helping the kids. And um, in the meantime, as we've said all along, we're just giving you grace here. Don't worry about having your kids in service. I know that's harder for you to take notes, but understand that, that we're okay with it. And we enjoy children and, and love just uh, loving alongside you as, as we go through that. So I just, uh, I'm just i just so happy that you're here with us today. What a great day to, to praise our Lord and Savior. And we're going to keep doing that through song right now. Amen. Stand with us again. Let's continue singing and worship this morning. The very great I am this morning. Let's sing.
Amen. Great I am. Any worthy of our praise, of our glory, and our honor? Ah, oh, there is nobody greater. The great I am. And you know, we're in this next song. Um, it asks the very question in the title: Is he worthy? Is Jesus worthy of our praise and our honor and our glory? And you know, the first time I heard this song, and this doesn't happen very often, the first time I heard this song, I was brought to tears. And many of you may know this song, probably do. The first time I heard it, it just brought me to tears because, it, like I said, it asked the question, is he worthy? But not only does it ask the question, it answers it emphatically, he is. He is worthy of our praise. He is the Lamb of God that went to the cross for me and for you. And because of that, we have the grace and forgiveness of our sin. Isn't that awesome? We should never get tired of that. That should never be dull for us. And so as we sing this song, I'm, I'm telling you, let's worship in this. Let's worship the name because the answer to that question is he is worthy. Let's sing it. Listen to this and then answer this please. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deeper? Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you Is he worthy? 
sending your son Jesus to die for us. We know because of that finished work of the cross that he is worthy of our honor and our glory and our praise. And Lord, what a picture of that. That's, that's from revelation of what, what it's going to be like one day when we're all in heaven worshiping and praising, sitting around the throne. Who is worthy? Jesus, you are worthy. And we're so thankful this morning. And God, I pray now that as we open up your word, God, speak to our hearts. God, we just want to hear from you. We are so glad that you're here with us, God. We, we were doing this all for naught if you wasn't. We praise you, we glorify you, and we lift you up, Lord. And now open our hearts to hear what you have to say for us from your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. If you're joining us online, you didn't get to see that cool sermon bumper that just <laughs> displayed, but we're working towards that. Uh, we are working towards enhancing our online experience with some different cameras and um, switching some of that stuff that goes along with having a nice video for you to see. But we appreciate you joining in on our single camera uh, virtual campus, and uh, you know, we're here to honor Christ by singing together and studying his word, and whether that's with one camera or many cameras, or whether that's online or in person, we're grateful to be doing that together. And I am grateful for y'all to be here this morning and to be worshiping with you and to sing of our King. Man, I, I'm, I'm already stirred towards loving Christ this morning and thankful for the way that being with other believers, singing with other believers does that. And there is something unique about singing with other believers. Uh, this isn't in my notes, but it, it's worth it's worth saying that, that when we sing as a congregation, that God already ha talks to us in his word about gathering together. There, there is a benefit to that as the church, but there, there is also just something human about being affirmed in the truth as well. And when we are all singing God's worth together and God's nature together, that's affirming and it should be, and it should stir us hopefully even differently than it does on our own. So I'm grateful. Thank you, band, for leading us in all of that. Well, two weeks ago, we defined wisdom as this, as decision-making that enjoys and honors God. That's one way to define wisdom. I think it's a very biblical way to look at wisdom, decision-making that enjoys and honors God. That gets at the attitude of the way we make decisions. That gets at the motivation of the way we make decisions. And wisdom is all about decisions, beliefs, and following through with actions. So last week, Micah walked us through Proverbs 1, verse 8 through 19, and we learned that the way of sin is enticing, the way of greed is enticing, but they never deliver, which is going to be true of so much of Scripture, that Scripture teaches us that the ways of the world will never deliver, that there's only one thing that will truly deliver, and that is Jesus Christ. And so we're thankful for that faithful teaching through Proverbs 1, 8 through 19. And last in that passage, we learned that those who do evil and those who are foolish will try to have you join them. But Solomon, who is given credit for these verses here, Solomon says, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Do not walk in the way of the greedy and the evil and the foolish. Do not walk in the way with them. Instead, walk in the way of wisdom. 
Instead, walk with the way of wisdom. And that's where we pick up today. Solomon introduces us to wisdom. In verse 20, which is where we'll be starting, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 20, in this series on Proverbs, we're moving right along, and we're introduced to Lady Wisdom. And so I would like for you to look with me if you have your Bibles. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20. If you're on new version with us, wherever you're following, it'll be on the screen. If you're here with us in person, verse 20 says this. Proverbs 1, verse 20 says, Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? In these three verses, we we get a principle here that wisdom wants to be found. Wisdom wants to be found. You notice in verses 20 through 22 that wisdom is not hiding away. Wisdom is screaming for attention. Wisdom is crying out in the streets, loudly trying to get your attention. Out in the front of the city, at the head of the noisy street, she cries out. And we get this image that wisdom is for everyone. Wisdom is for everyone. Notice that wisdom's not sitting in the ivory towers waiting for the scholars to find her. Wisdom isn't hidden in some faraway place after a 30-day hunger strike. Wisdom isn't unattainable. Wisdom is for everyone. This, this scenario that Solomon's giving us is this crowded street. It's, it's a town center. I mean, everyone is coming through here. In, in, the, in the time when this would have been written, the, the town center, the gates would have been, I mean, every person walks through the, there. It's for everyone. And in this noisy city, there are a lot of things vying for your attention. There's a lot of things that wisdom is having, having to shout over. Notice, if wisdom was the only one, there would be no need for screaming. There would be no need for crying out. But there's a lot vying for attention and a lot that is folly. You can imagine this busy market. You know, we've even got a picture up there. But you can imagine a, a busy market, but instead of merchants wanting your money in this busy market, they want your time, they want your decisions, they want your life. And these merchants have different names, right? They're not selling, uh, they're not selling fabrics or oils or whatever fragrances. They're selling things like comfort and wealth and attention, distraction and power. And all these merchants make promises, like the young men in chapter one, verses thirteen and fourteen. They all make these promises, and they say, "Come with us." We shall find all the precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. This is what is being said underneath the cries of wisdom in the city. But these enticements, they're all lies. They're all false. They don't live up to it. These merchants are all liars and fighting to be heard over that crowd of lies, trying to reach you before you can be deceived by the rest, Lady Wisdom calls out her warnings. Oh, how long, oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? It's an interesting warning because it's not, don't go that way. <laughs> Don't do that, right? And that's, that's what you think of as a warning. But here in this warning, you, you get a sense of exhaustion. Wisdom has seen this over and over and over. You walk into the gates and you, you're simple. And you come back into the gates and you remain simple. And you come back into the gates and you remain a scoffer and foolish and ignorant. How long? How long? If you think you're the first, you're not. How long will people come along thinking that they're the first person walking or the person who will do things differently? It is interesting in the text here to recognize that Solomon is personifying wisdom. This is wisdom calling out. And it's something that happens throughout Proverbs, but it's worth us asking why. Why does the author do this? Why does God do this through Solomon that he personifies wisdom? What does it mean for wisdom to be personified? 
Why is he doing it? And why does he choose a woman as he speaks specifically to young men? If you remember uh, in the introduction of Proverbs, it's addressed to his sons. When we said there's application broadly for everyone, but it is written to a son. So what is the relationship there? That's why it's important to understand context, that there is a uh, wisdom being personified as woman written to sons. So what does that mean? Why does that all work together? Well, uh, one reason that wisdom is personified is that the work of wisdom is active. The work of wisdom is active. It's not dead. The work of wisdom is is engrossed in our life. It's, it's wrapped up in us. Wisdom is growing and not always the same day to day. A wise response to someone may not look the same now as it did 50 years ago. A wise response to someone today may not be wise tomorrow. What is wise in one culture may not be wise in another culture. So it's growing and not always the same. But to think of wisdom as a person helps us consider how we interact with wisdom. It's like a relationship. You know, if you give up a relationship, if the last time you've talked to someone or seen them uh, is five years ago, then you're not going to know them that well when you come back into contact. And some of you are like, well, I've had friends I haven't seen in 30 years. And when we see each other, it's like we've never, we've never stopped seeing each other. Well, that's great. You can still get along with wisdom if you haven't seen it in 30 years, but you're not going to know it well. You're not going to understand the day-to-day of what they've been dealing with. Wisdom, when we leave it, we're not going to know it well. So it, it, personifying it helps us think through how we interact with it, that we need to pursue wisdom, not just to be like, well, I made it. <laughs> I'm wise now. I'm, I'm where I need to be. But that, that we need to continue pursuing it like, like a relationship as a man to his wife, that if, if at one point I'm like, well, I know everything there is to know about my wife, Crystal, that's not going to love her very well in five years, in two years, in six months. <laughs> That's not going to know her very well. When she has a baby in a couple of months, in fact, like I know everything, like her, her world is changing and the way that wisdom interacts in the world is changing. So one reason to personify wisdom. But another reason uh, I, I believe uh, we can see here that Solomon chooses to personify wisdom as a woman is because young men should want wisdom like they want women. And, and I think we can all understand that, right? Either as a woman, you understand the way that young men are interested in, in women. And as a man, you understand. I mean, wherever you are in life, you understand. And so Solomon is leveraging that built-in desire for men and saying, look, wisdom is, is better than this, is worth pursuing. Wisdom is, should be something that you desire the same way that you desire to find a young woman to love. There's, there's really, I, I think, in, in our makeup, there's very few things like the desire for a, a man to find a wife. That's, it, is, it is ingrained, and it's something that, um, not, it's ingrained for a lot of men there to find that. And so when, when Solomon is teaching his son here, he's saying, look, in the same passion, in the same motivation, I want you to pursue wisdom with that same desire. The pursuit that comes with desire then is a pursuit that we should use as we go after wisdom. I mean, young guys will make gigantic efforts to impress and get the girl, right? I mean, I, one of the things that blows my mind right now is promposals. Um, I, I'm just... Some of you guys are in high school. Uh, some of you have done promposals. I'm looking at some of our high schoolers, and they're like looking at each other. That's fantastic. Uh, y'all, y'all, that's great. When I was in prom, it was like, uh, when I was in high school, go, going to prom was like, you walk up to a locker, and you're like, hey, you want to you go to prom? <laughs> but now it's like this exact, uh, ex- ex- extravagant, that's the word. It's like this extravagant moment where you've got to, it's almost like bigger than a wedding, pro- a marriage proposal at this point. But it's worth it for the young guys who would normally not show that type of emotion and affection because of the young woman they're pursuing, right? You see that, that enormous effort that they give. I mean, it, love and desire and infatuation for young men changes guys. I mean, it changes guys. I, you, you find, I mean, these are all classic things that happen a lot in our society. But you can find a guy who has his close group of friends. He's hanging out with them all the time. He meets this girl, and it's like his, his close group of friends never existed. <laughs> I mean, he, he rejects them to follow the girl, to pursue the girl. That pursuit is, is consuming for a young man. It consumes their attention. They write love songs. They spend money. They invest time. 
And Solomon's saying, wisdom is that fair maiden worth your unending infatuation. Wisdom is worth pursuing with that same effort and with that same level of desire. And this lady, Lady Wisdom, says, how long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? And I mentioned this kind of feels exhausted, but it also feels gentle at the same time. It's asking the question. It's not condemning. But while it also feels gentle and exhaust, exhausted, it, it, I can also read some aggression in, in what's happening here. I mean, how long will you be simple? There's an urgency to what is being said. How Lady Wisdom is speaking to those coming in to the city. Wisdom identifies here three types of people. If you notice in, in verse 22, the simple, which is na- naive, ignorant, the scoffers, which is cynical, which is common in our society, both so far, and then also fools, which, again, I mean, this is as true today as it was for Solomon. It's true, true today as it was at any day that there are fools now that are morally bankrupt, that hate knowledge, that hate God. How long will the simple, the scoffers, the fools continue in their ways? It doesn't really matter which type of person it is coming through this gate as far as what that means for what happens to them. Whether it's the naive, the cynical, or the morally bankrupt, each of these will find the same end in destruction. That's what happens to each of these. Whatever whatever led to that end, they will find that end if they're rejecting wisdom. Unless they turn, unless they find wisdom, the simple, the scoffers, and the fools will find destruction. But how will they find this beautiful woman? How will they find wisdom? Right? That's a really good question. We're all sitting in here thinking, it's a good thing I'm not simple. It's a good thing I'm not a scoffer, and it's a good thing I'm not a fool. But we need to be careful not to read ourselves out of this text completely. I mean, we are the simple, the scoffers, and the fools. That's exactly who we are here. We are not the wise, and we need to always be coming back and saying, where am I missing? Where am I not wise? And how do we find this beautiful woman wisdom? Let's look at verse 23. Verse 23 says this, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 23. If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refuse to listen. I have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. And as I'm reading that, I'm like, I'm reading that with some, some intentionality, some passion. But this is being cried out. This is being yelled out. I mean, this is at the top of her voice. If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I mean, that's the tone that we're told she's speaking with here. And she is concerned with the humility of her listeners. That's what's happening here. Wisdom is unlocked by humility. Wisdom is unlocked by humility. We find wisdom yelling loudly at the front of the city gate, and everyone can hear her. And the question is, why aren't they listening? If it's that much clearer, Mark, that wisdom provides a better life and a a good way, why doesn't everyone listen to wisdom? They don't listen to wisdom because of pride, because of ignorance, because they know better. And if you think you know better, that is either pride or ignorance, <laughs> maybe both. And I think pride and ignorance feed off of each other. It's a, it's a kind of a vicious cycle of, in my ignorance, I think I know, and in, think I, in thinking I know, I maintain my ignorance. Because if we thought we didn't know, we would look for answers. And here's people walking into the town, and it's like, you know, the guy who's trying to hand you the stuff in the mall and you're just like, I'm good. I'm just trying to hit GameStop real fast. Like, I'm not trying to do your makeup stuff right now. Uh, that's, that's, that's what you can imagine people doing to wisdom here. But wisdom is giving the truth. Wisdom is trying to save lives. And in pride and ignorance, people are ending in destruction. But in humility, we're able to turn. In humility, we're able to turn towards wisdom 
the simple, the scoffers and fools, we learn from verses 23 through 25 that the simple, the scoffers and the fools, they wouldn't turn. They refused to listen. They didn't heed correction. They ignored counsel. They would have none of wisdom's reproof. When you look at that list of things, this is the behavior of pride. This is, when you look at what, what, how does pride show itself? Pride shows itself in a defensiveness towards correction. Pride shows itself in, in being offended when someone comes to you with, with a way that you might be in sin or need to change or that they might know better. Pride says, I'm good. It's the behavior of thinking you know better. When we think we have nothing to learn, we reject wisdom and embrace folly. The, the danger is that we believe we become experts in fields. And, and it might be that you're an expert in your family, which you are, don't get me wrong. But that because I'm an expert in my family, there's really no one else who can speak into my family. That is a dangerous, dangerous road to walk down. Look, I've done all the reading on this political issue. So I'm an expert. I don't need your opinion. I'm good. That is a dangerous, dangerous place to be. Anytime you believe that you're an expert without a need for others to speak into that situation, you have boxed yourself into a position of foolishness when you probably think you're boxing yourself into a position of wisdom. Proverbs 11, 2 says this, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. With the humble is wisdom. Pride comes and wisdom are enemies. Pride and wisdom are enemies. They don't coexist. The wise are not prideful. And many times, pride exposes itself in us, not, not just as uh, trying to show ourselves as experts or becoming defensive, but, but pride also looks like power in our lives, that I'm in control, that I, I'm going to have the last word, that I'm going to be stronger Wisdom doesn't look like that. Wisdom looks like humility, that I'm willing to take the loss, that I'm willing to not look like I'm in control. We can't be filled with pride and at the same time be filled with wisdom. But humility unlocks wisdom. Humility, unlike pride, is essential to the Christian life. A Christ follower must be humble those two things go together. They cannot be separated. A Christ follower must be humble. Humility is essential to the Christian life. First Peter 5 says, humble yourselves. Philippians 2 says, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. I'm going to say that again because it's so important. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Psalm 149 says, God adorns the humble with salvation. Matthew 18 says, whoever humbles himself like a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's a small selection of the verses that push us towards humility. If that doesn't prove the point, though, here's one last one. Let's enjoy Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 together. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says this. Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. These men and women walking through this city gate hearing wisdom are not acting in gentleness and lowliness in heart. They are acting in self-certainty and pride, saying, I don't need what you're saying. I'm good. But for the Christ follower, we take on the yoke of Jesus. We learn from Jesus. He's gentle and he's lowly in heart. And when we do, we'll find rest for our souls. When we do, we'll be humble and we'll unlock wisdom. So humility unlocks wisdom because humility looks like Jesus. In the midst of your financial burdens, in the midst of caring for your children and home day after day after day, in the midst of a pandemic that has turned political and divisive and lonely, in the midst of your stress at work and at home and even at church, 
while all those voices are calling out to you, in the midst of all of that, in your humility, listen to the voice of wisdom. Single out the voice that matters. Single out the voice of wisdom. And ultimately, that voice of wisdom is going to sound a lot like Scripture. It's going to sound a lot like the Bible when we ground ourselves in what Jesus has given us, his word. In your humility, listen to the voice of wisdom. That voice is pointing you to the sufficiency of Jesus for flourishing in every area, every area of your life. That's what wisdom points us to, is human flourishing. So if you're looking for human flourishing in your stress and your anxiety and your ability to control, stop, because you're not going to find it there. Start looking to Christ for that, because he is the source of wisdom, and in that, he gives those things. He is almighty and completely able. He is in control, and he knows what you need. So stop trying to be in control. Stop trying to convince everyone you're fine or that you've got it where you need to be or that, you are, that you've got the image that you're trying to portray. I mean, it's okay if the image you're trying to portray to the world is not how you're feeling inside. Break that image and, and let in the people who God has given you to, to understand what's happening inside of your world. I mean, we're going to see, we're going to come to this point in this passage that this promise of human flourishing doesn't mean that every day is going to be fine. It's not, it's not a, a promise of wealth and prosperity. It is a promise of peace in those storms. So stop trying to be in control. Stop trying to convince everyone you're fine because that is pride. And when humans are prideful, we are either simple or scoffers or we're fools. So if you want wisdom, humble yourself and ask God for it. Because rejecting wisdom because of our pride has consequences. Let's look, continue in the passage, verse 26. Verse 26, Proverbs chapter 1. I also, so this is still Lady Wisdom talking here. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but, I will, but will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. This is a heartbreaking passage. And in this heartbreaking passage, we see that wisdom scorned brings calamity. You should be a little bit proud that I used the word calamity there. Uh, I, don't, I've, I haven't heard the word calamity since I watched like Looney Tunes. So uh, it's good. But, that's, but this is true, right? That there is calamity coming. In verse 27, calamity. Verse 26, calamity. We're just using the words of the text. Wisdom scorned brings calamity. If we reject decisions that honor and enjoy God, we are going to suffer the consequences of that decision making. When we are foolish, we are dishonoring God and choosing to find joy in other things. When we are foolish, we are dishonoring God and finding joy in other things. That's what foolishness is. So if wisdom is making decisions that enjoy and honor God, then foolishness is the opposite. It's making decisions that find joy in other things and dishonor God. Solomon teaches us that the consequences of this decision-making, the consequences, consequences of pursuing anything other than God, leads to calamity like a whirlwind, terror like a storm, and distress and anguish. Those are the consequences. So when you're like, okay, Mark, I hear you talking about wisdom. I see that you're saying, I see the scriptures talking about wisdom. That's fine. I see you talking against foolishness. I don't know that it matters to me. I don't really care. You don't have to care, but you will be made to care because there will be a point where you suffer those consequences of your foolishness. That, that, is, that is the principle we're teaching here, that God is teaching here, that these things will come to those who reject wisdom. For all of this misery, you'd think that wisdom would feel compassion. But nah, that's, like, that's, not, that's not what wisdom is filling here. Wisdom isn't, isn't showing a lot of empathy towards these consequences. 
So uh, one of the questions that I, I was wondering is like, why, why would Lady Wisdom be so harsh? Like when I'm reading through this text, I'm like, why wouldn't Lady Wisdom be like, and I'm sorry that you're having to deal with this. Like, I hate that you're having to go through this. You, you would almost think that that would be the position of wisdom. But instead, she mocks and she laughs. Her response is mocking and laughter. The reason is because she is wise. The reason that that is her response is wisdom. I, I, I'll say this before I explain that. It's not harsh to allow someone to receive the prize of their decisions. When someone chooses a way, if you give them their way, that's not harsh. That's just fair. That's just just. And so here, we're not saying, well, why is she, being, why is she harsh? She's not. She's being fair. So the message from her is not, sow your wild oats and someday it will work out. Like that's not the message of wisdom. I think especially of, of our college students and high schoolers uh, are fresh out of college. The, the biblical wisdom is not, go get it out of the way now. Get it out of the way while you're young. That is not a biblical message. The biblical message for you, if you are young and considering, I, I hate the term wild oats. I don't really like it. I don't know why I used it. But if you're considering doing the things you want, the things that seem attractive, the things that social media elevates into the success of your youth. If you're thinking on those things, you're like, but it seems fine. Recognize the messages you're listening to. Those are the merchants that are the liars that will lead you down paths you do not want to go down, making promises that seem better than they can ever possibly be. But wisdom is yelling at you in truth. Wisdom is saying, don't follow those things. Don't do what looks attractive in the world. Instead, follow Jesus. Follow in the fear of the Lord. Because if you choose foolishness, if you choose the way of the liars, if you choose this foolishness, you will suffer because of it. Maybe temporary joy is something you'll find. Let's be honest. There's temporary joy in sin. Temporary happiness, maybe, in sin. But the end of that path is destruction. So make your decision. I mean, you need to have the tools to make that decision. And that's not just true for high schoolers and college students. That's true for every stage of life. It's just the scenarios change. Sometimes we get better at hiding in our sins <laughs> as we get older. But here in each, no matter what your scenario is, there is consequence for our foolishness. Better to choose wisdom before destruction finds you. That's wisdom. Better to choose wisdom before destruction finds you. In the middle of a storm, and a storm of your own making because of your foolishness, in the middle of a storm, don't expect to be bailed out of your consequences by suddenly coming to your senses. Coming to your senses doesn't remove the consequences from you. It changes your perspective before you make the next decision to bring new consequences. So understand that. And the call of wisdom is come to your senses now. Come to your senses at the front of the city as you're coming through the gates. Come to your senses. Understand that there are lies that sound good and will not hold up under the weight of reality. Coming to your senses is the point, though, of punishment and consequences. The reason that there are consequences attached to foolishness is so that people will come to their senses. That's, that's the point. That's the whole reason. It's God's reason for correction. And this is what he says about it in the New Testament. If, if you've got your Bibles, you can flip over to 2 Timothy 2, which is um, maybe a little harder to find in your New Testament, but you can find it there. 2 Timothy 2, um, if you're your new version, it's super simple to find. 2 Timothy 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 22 is where we're going to pick up. This is what God says about correction. And I'm going to read you the whole context of, of, this verse, uh, of these verses. Uh, verses 22 through 26 is what we're going to read together. And this is what 2 Timothy 2 says. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, 
correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So according to Paul, those caught up in youthful passions, participating in foolish, ignorant controversies that breed quarrels are, in fact, in the snare of the devil. That's strong, church. (laughs) That is strong. That those who are in youthful passions, participating in foolish and ignorant controversies that breed quarrels are, in fact, in the snare of the devil, captured by the devil to do his will. And that is serious. That's something for us to understand and internalize, that we should avoid youthful passions of anger and revenge and getting the last word. If you're married, does that not hit you? Avoid foolish and ignorant controversies. I mean, 2020, I I just don't know that we really need any more explanation of that point for our application and avoid quarreling, because that is the work of Satan. That is the work of foolishness. Wisdom instead. Man, oh, church. Church, do you want to see people come to Christ? Do you want to see the world change with the gospel? Then look like Christ. Then live like Christ. In so many ways, the church in America is, is flat, it comes up short in proclaiming a gospel because our lives don't, don't seem any different. Like there's no joy. There's no difference. It's, it's all the same. There's all, like, why would I want to be a part of something where I, I can do the same quarreling and the same, the same uh, part, be a part of the ignorant controversies and have the same anger and, and same passions? What is the point? What's even the point? We're presenting that picture that's your life. At Provision Church, we've, we talk about this a lot, but that we don't, we don't go and do a lot of like mission events as the church. Our goal is not that people would come into our sanctuary, our, our auditorium, wherever that might be. Uh, our goal is not that people might come into the auditorium and be saved. That is a goal. Praise God if that happens. Our greater goal is that the church might go out to where God has sent them and people come to Christ and then be a part of the church as they grow in discipleship. <laughs> like that's, that's, that's the hope. And so what does that mean if that we look like the world in our daily lives? Why are they ever going to believe us about the gospel? If they're waiting on the pastor of the church to lead them to Christ, we're, that's an unbiblical view of the life of the church and of the Christian. That we should each be evangelizing. And we'll do, we've done and we will continue to do events and big events and see people come to Christ in those scenarios as well. But that is not the main thing. The main thing is us living sent individually each as God has called us according to the Great Commission to go and make disciples. And that will build God's church. That will build his kingdom as he does that, as the Holy Spirit does that work through us. So here in 2 Timothy, he says, avoid these things. That's the work of foolishness, these things. Instead, wisdom leads us to follow Christ in our living. Because wisdom leads us to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, and pure hearts. That's what we see from 2 Timothy. That's the work of righteousness and following Christ. Pursuing righteousness, faith, love, peace, and pure hearts. Pursuing kindness to everyone, even those who might oppress us or make us angry. Able to teach. And we're not able to teach if we've made enemies. An enemy will not be taught by you. Only friends will be taught. Enduring evil being gentle. Paul points to this wise behavior as a part of the way that God brings people to repentance. I mean, it's this this type of pursuing righteousness, this type of wise living that God uses. It's a part of what God does to bring people to repentance. We see that in the text. So if God's people choose to act foolishly, not only do we sin in our own foolishness, but we stand in the way of the repentance of others. Church, don't stand in the way of the repentance of others. It should be our hope that someone in the middle of foolishness would escape that foolishness. That should be our hope and our goal because that is God's goal. So why does wisdom seem harsh in the passage in Proverbs? Because wisdom shares God's goal for the people, that God may perhaps 
grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. That's the goal, that they might have repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. And what a glorious picture that someone might be set free from the bondage of Satan himself. And that comes through wisdom and humility, and it comes through the church living as the church. The wisdom of God wants people to come to their senses. We must then maintain that position of wisdom in kindness, gentleness, unity, compassion, like 2 Timothy teaches. I want us to remember, before we finish this passage out, remember what Jesus told us about living as a, as a follower of him. Take on his yoke, learn from him, for he is gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So wisdom leads to the real, historical, biblical Jesus, but ignorance and folly lead to destruction. Look at verse 32 and 33, the final two verses of our passage this morning. Proverbs 1, verse 32, For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. The starting place of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Do you remember that from Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7? The starting place of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So verse 32 is most of all referencing the turning away from God. The simple are killed by their turning away. They're turning away from what? They're turning away from the fear of the Lord. The complacency of fools is the complacency that remains in the filth of sin. The complacency of a guy's apartment in college in cleaning. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but I, if you've ever seen a guy's apartment in college, man, they are very complacent when it comes to clean living. Uh, there's trash every mine. I can, I'm only speaking from my experience, but like trash everywhere, sink overflowing. You'd rather buy new dishes than wash the ones you have because guys are notoriously complacent about their living conditions in college. Spiritual complacency, though, destroys us. The complacency of fools is the complacency that remains in sin. Only the work of the Holy Spirit to show us the urgency of our need can wake us from this complacency and this simplicity of verse 32. But this simpleness, this complacency, it kills and destroys. Foolishness recognizes our human condition and ignores it. It, it either ignores it or it refuses to even recognize the condition it's in. That's foolishness. Wisdom recognizes our human condition and says, I need a savior. Wisdom sees our condition and says, we cannot save ourselves. It is impossible. I need help. And we got that help. That's the good news of wisdom. That's why wisdom leads us to Jesus is because wisdom shows us we are broken, that we are sinners, that our best efforts make things worse. And yet one came, one came who didn't make things worse. One came who made things better. But let me ask you this right now. Let me, let me, if you're watching online, if you're here right now, do you recognize the need? I mean, for your own self, in your own mind, do you recognize the need? Are you, are you seeing the sin in your world and in your life destroying things? Do you feel that there's something more? I can tell you whether you can admit that or not, that in your life you're looking for something more. That's, that's human nature. We are looking for something more. We're looking for something more in relationships. We're looking for something more in identity. We're looking for something more in our moral behavior. We're looking for something more in job success. We can build a long, long list. But I can tell you, no matter what you're looking for that something more in, it will come up short. And your experience and your history can attest to that. Your experience and your history, if you're honest with yourself, you know that the best things that you've done apart from Christ have not been good enough. That soon the high of that ends and disappointment comes back in and the need for something more comes up. But Jesus doesn't come up empty. Jesus 
There, there's not a high that you come down from. There's not something more that you need. He is it. He is sufficient. He is the something more. And he's not the something more because he makes your life better. He is the something more because he is the purpose of your life. He is the something more. He came to die for your sins. He came to take, the, take your place because you deserved punishment. You deserve the consequences of your foolishness because all of us have been foolish at one point or another. We all have been, and he took the place for us. He died on the cross for our sins. And the beautiful thing is that he didn't stay dead, that he rose again. He rose from the grave, and in his rising, we have hope for an eternity with him. We have this great hope that the suffering of this world is only temporary. That we can live in peace and without anxiety because we know what he has done for us. He has died for our sins and he rose again and he is coming again soon. He calls out to you like wisdom does. He calls out to you. The question is, how will you respond? How will you respond to the call of Christ? Will you believe Jesus for your salvation? We believe that what he says is true, that what he has done is sufficient. Will you turn from the idols that have filled your life with lies? Will you turn to the truth and turn to Jesus? Or will you listen to the merchants in the street calling out in foolishness with promises that will not hold up? That's the decision before you. That is the decision before each human It's the Holy Spirit that leads us to verse 33. That whoever follows Jesus will dwell secure, be at ease, and have no dread of disaster. Man, what a beautiful thing. That wisdom leads us to this because wisdom leads us to Jesus. That the person who follows Jesus will be secure in their Savior today and tomorrow and forever. I want to finish with John 16, 33. I think it so finishes this so beautifully. John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Church, let's, let's take that time right now. Let's, let's pray to God. I, I'm going to pray with you, but I want you praying too. And let's take time to pray that we might have humility, that we might turn to wisdom, and that that would happen not for our moral growth, but for our growth in Christ. And if you have questions, ask someone. Find someone who confesses, professes Christ as their Savior, and ask those questions. We'll be around after the service. You can always DM us or message us on social media. Let's pray together for these things. Father, we thank you for your word, that we're able to approach it this morning, and that that in humility we're able to learn, that, that we're able to um, be changed by your word. We recognize that it's not because we are great enough to have humility, but that's because you're good enough and, and you are kind enough, you're generous enough that in your providence you would, you would let, you would, as the Holy Spirit, you would come to us and open our eyes, that you would awaken us to our need. Father, we thank you for that. And we, we pray uh, that as we, as we go today, that as, as there might be questions that come out of this text, and as we are challenged in our own lives where we might be acting foolishly instead of with wisdom, I pray that you would uh, give courage to those who are listening, that they would not just let those things subside, that they wouldn't let time just ease the struggle in their heart right now and the, and the struggle in their mind right now. But God, that, again, in your kindness, that you would give them the courage to have the hard conversations. God, we thank you for hard conversations. And we pray that by your grace, there would be many hard conversations as we grow more like you. Father, we love you. Pray in your name. Amen. As we end this time, stand with us. What a great song to end this time with. Sing with us and let's cry out to the Father. Run to the Father. i mm-hmm.
Wow, I don't know about you, but what a blessing when we are pushed by God's word. And thank you so much, Pastor Mark, for that teaching. It, it's, it's all about the being discipled. And I was just reading, as so I was getting ready to come up here, you know, talking about the, the pride and wisdom can be enemies there. You know, we, we so many times, we have this insatiable need to be right. And when we step back and realize that we can all use correction, we can all use wisdom. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, most of y'all know Pastor Donnie Gamble, I heard him say years ago, I want to be a lifelong learner. And I've seen him live that out, even in, in more of a retirement season of his ministry, still taking classes and learning, and, and, I, and I want to always be pursuing Christ and learning and being wiser. And so when we realize that and we have that humble heart, boy, that can just bring us so much closer to the Father. And that sometimes means, you know, just being listening to that neighbor of yours. It means not hitting post when we're ready to post that meme on Facebook, whatever that is that we have that humble heart and that desire for wisdom to draw closer to the Father. And, and as Mark said earlier, if you don't understand what all that means or you have questions about that, message us on social media. Come see any of us. Jim's here. Kevin's here. Um, we, you know, Shannon, Mark, we are, or anybody around you, we are here to help you draw closer to Christ. If you have questions, please come see us. Just one more thing uh, before we go today. You know, we believe... In life, we believe life in at the beginning of conception, and, and boy, love life is doing such a great job of just speaking for the unborn and their prayer ministry. If you got to join us last year, what a sweet time! Is we didn't, no, no one's there screaming, yelling. It's simply a, a walk we made around the block near that abortion clinic in Charlotte that, that we know is, is just one of the biggest. It has a distinction of being one of the biggest, if not the biggest, in the southeast. And that's not a distinction that we're very proud of in our community. But through prayer, we have seen love given to the women who have come to that clinic. And we've seen lives saved. And so we are doing it a little bit differently this year. Um, as you see, um, August 9th is kind of the big kickoff launch Sunday for that. And then the following Saturday or Wednesday, the 12th, is the uh, prayer and fasting. And then that um, Saturday on August 15th is when they're having the walk. Now, that's a lot of information. You don't need to remember that for me. Simply go to the hub on provisionnc.com. Go to the hub and click on events. And all of this will be explained to you, ways you can participate. You can participate in the walk virtually this year, or you can go. But we do want you to sign up so we know that we are supporting and participating as a church. So go to the events page there on our website, read through all that, and be sure to sign up for that so you can be a part of, of Love Life this year. It's such an important part, and we want to continue to encourage and support this wonderful ministry. Well, I hope you all have a wonderful week, and I, we're just praying continually for our community, and so let's pray together as we go out and try to live our message that we hear about every single Sunday, to live, sit, and change the world. I hope those are empty words to you, but that's a conscious thought in your mind of how you can change the world this week. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your teaching, for your son. Thank you that we get to be a part of that and worship you here in this place. And just as we go out from here, I pray that we will live, sent and change the world. In your name, amen. God bless you all. Have a great week.